Hi, my name is Kate and I love to read. Like, I was carrying books around with me before Kindles were a thing. So I decided to start a podcast where I interview the authors of some of my favorite books, ask them all of my questions so that I can read between the lines of the books. Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Between the Lines. Due to a little bit of scheduling miscommunication, we ended up recording this while Books and Brews in Zionsville was actually open. I do want to thank them for letting us record there. Um, but you might actually hear some noise in the background um, because there were actually people there. And it probably sounds a couple times like I might be yelling my questions at my guest, but um it's just because i was trying to talk over everybody so for this first episode rj jacobs uh was willing to come up to indiana and talk to me about his most recent book somewhere in the dark i read it this year it was one of my favorites that i read this year it's amazing um if you haven't read it go read it and then come back and listen to this or at the point where I announced that we're going to start talking about spoilers, you can stop at that point and go read it if you've gotten interested. So with that being said, let's get into the first episode. We are here at Books and Brews in Zionsville, and it's a pretty hopping Friday night, so you might hear people in the background a little bit. But I'm here with RJ Jacobs, who wrote Somewhere in the Dark that I read this year. Um reached out and asked if you wanted to talk about the book and here we are here we are here we are so yeah, thrilled um, to be here <laughs> thank you he actually drove all the way up here so thank you for that <laughs> um so i'll just get started um when did you know you wanted to write a book or when did you know you wanted to be an author yeah so i've been writing kind of in some form or another i was i was trying to think about like actually when i got started doing it and it's pretty much been since like i was in high school Wow. Um, but you can imagine kind of what the early stuff was like. Right. Uh, not not terribly great. Yeah. And a friend of mine taught script writing for a while. Nice. And he said that like his students, a lot of them really wrote a lot of scripts about just their friends. It's kind of like not a great story. Yeah. You know, some of it is kind of like you need someone to teach you how to construct a story. Right. Like develop characters, increase tension have a, a plot that drives towards something kind of without that, like some of the early stuff sort of suffers. So, but you know, I think just about everybody who's been a writer has to get some of those out, Yeah, you know, to kind of learn a little bit how, how to do it. But I think it's really helpful to have some instruction. Yeah. I mean, anytime you start anything, that's like the kind of unfortunate part is that right. you're not going to be good at it. So it's like the hardest thing to get over yeah. anytime you want to do something. Yeah. Yeah. But that being said, so your your friends kind of helped you with structure. Did that influence your writing process kind of early on, or what is your writing process like now? So, actually, my writing process as I've gone along has gotten more and more structured. Nice. So I actually we were talking a little while ago about the projects that I'm working on now. Yeah. I just turned in like a full synopsis of the next book that I'm about to start working on. And I've never actually done anything quite that detailed before. Oh, wow. In the beginning, you know, you just kind of feel like writing what you want to write. But um, it's almost like um, I was listening to, I'm listening to Dave Grohl's book right now. And he talks about his early days of being a drummer. And like when he sits down, when he's like a kid, he just starts hitting the drums like all kind of all over the place. And That's the teacher cool. like realized like how much work they're going to have to do. To like kind of get yeah, some discipline. Where he was. Right. And I think writing is a little bit like that, where in the beginning you just kind of want to go. Or like another metaphor is like like track. I used to run track when I was in high school. And a lot of people don't know that sprinting is very technical. And you know, some people like who get drawn into it, they just have a ton of energy and they want to run it out. And I think that writing is kind of like that too. Like there's a lot of like technical, conscientious, detail stuff that you have to pay attention to. Yeah. And, you know, but that's not necessarily like what drives you to want to write in the beginning. So like I've gotten more detail oriented because I wanted to hit the mark with the editor that I'm working on or working with, who's working with me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think in the, in the early days, you just kind of want to go. 
Yeah. Kind of want to write stuff. That makes a lot of sense. I kind of what I said earlier with everything. Like it is, it is kind of like when you first want to do something, you're like, yeah. I just want to do it. Like I don't yeah, want to turn go. it into anything necessarily. Yeah. It's all about fun at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. So if it wasn't super structured for you at first and you would just kind of, would you just kind of have feelings about characters you wanted to write or would sure. you have ideas about the plot that you wanted yeah, to write? Yeah, you'd have like a sketch. Yeah. I don't know how everybody else does it, but I'd have like a sketch in my mind or like a scene mm -hmm. and kind of going off of that and like you don't even quite know where it's going to take you. Um, but the problem is, is that those don't end up being amazing. Like, yeah. It's, I think sometimes it's better to kind of know like how it's going to end mm -hmm. as you get going. There are other writers out there who I'm telling you, they have no idea and they start on chapter one, line one, and they end up with a great novel. That's what blows my mind. Yeah. I had heard that when um, I heard Leanne Moriarty talking about uh, the one that was the one that was turned into an HBO series. Um, basically, she said that like she knew about the characters and who they were, but she didn't know how it was going to end. And that like blew my mind because yeah. I can't imagine approaching it completely like that. Like, it seems like some people are like, yeah, all of it comes to me as I'm writing. And I've always felt like if I were to write, which I've thought about, it would have to be so like, I would need to kind of know yeah. what my ending was. But some people say it just like, them intuitively. I'm like, I'll tell you some so of it crazy. I think is that like it changes a little bit as you go along and I think a lot of writers probably relate to that but yeah. like um, as you get to know the characters they have experiences and like you get into a situation and think no it would be much better if they did this or that's not really the way that you originally conceived of it I think it's not going to be like that right. it's truer to them if they did it like that yeah. So it sort of shifts, I think, as you go. Yeah. So someone I was talking to last week, um, she was talking about how she would go through and like write her characters, like write like 10 pages in that character's mind, even like for stuff that wasn't for the book. Oh, yeah. Is that something you've ever done, Ben? Is that like how you get to knowing what a character would do or yeah. how do you get there? Yeah. A little bit. There's like character sketches that yeah. you can kind of do. I think it's kind of that idea. Um. I, um, yeah, I, it's, it's almost like people, you know, you spend so much time with them right? that then you do kind of get to know what they would do, yeah. what they would think. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So you are a psychologist. I'm a psychologist. I was just making sure I know there's yeah. different versions of it. So how does that inform how you're writing your characters and writing your books? So I was thinking about this mm -hmm. and I would love to be able to say some really deep answer. Right. <laughs> but probably the most honest answer is that it's kind of an escape from that. That um, I tend to be kind of introverted mm -hmm. and I have a job that has a lot of FaceTime. Yeah. And I think to be a good psychologist, you really have to have a lot of boundaries and not a lot of involvement with the people that you're working with. Right. And in some ways, like when I'm done with the day, I really want to kind of leave all that behind and do something that is completely unrelated. Almost like we were talking about before, but yeah. it's a totally different life. Yes. And so in some ways that it is a really nice refuge. And when I talked to other writers who were writing during the pandemic, they said similar things about like creativity and writing being a refuge that they would go to. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of escape the stress of all the other stuff that they were doing. Um. I don't know how much I know about character from being a psychologist. I will yeah. say one thing is that um, I think I have a deeper sense of the pressures of a situation. Yes. There's like a sort of a social psychology element to it where it's like people kind of respond to their circumstances mm -hmm. more than um, the, the circumstances are much more predictive of behavior than character is. And I think yeah. a lot of people don't realize that. That makes a lot. That's a really good point, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what do you like to do when you're not writing? Man, well, I spend a lot of time with my kids. Um, and I, I run a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of an avid runner. I was in a soccer league a couple of weeks ago. Nice. Uh, me and uh, a buddy of mine, also as a therapist, mm -hmm. we were the oldest two guys there by probably like a decade. Oh, that's so awesome. it was sort of humbling, but yeah. it was kind of fun to do. Um. 
Yeah, you know, a lot of times there's just not enough hours in the day. So I agree. Uh, I'd like to take a little trip here and there, uh, but I'm pretty busy. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, so where did the idea come for Somewhere in the Dark? Like, what was, like, the first thought you had that got you writing? So I, I really like character where their liability kind of becomes their advantage. I love that. And it's sort of something that's hiding in plain sight that people almost kind of feel sorry for them about. Yep. But it becomes the thing that it makes them the only one who can solve the mystery. That is what it felt like. I have yeah. a lot more questions related to that, but that's exactly yeah. that was we were talking about that a little bit beforehand. That was one of the coolest parts for me about reading it was in the kind of psychological thriller or mystery thriller genre, there's a lot of the ending not even being happy. Like there's there's just a lot of strife in yeah. those stories. And there's a part of me that's very attracted to it. Like it, it creates so much tension and excitement. But reading your book, there was like, I was telling uh, Tyler on our way here, part of it felt like experiencing good therapy because it was seeing someone like have their trauma kind of being healed while it was still something that was useful for them. So that was like, that was why I ended up loving the book so much. Well, oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting the feedback that you get about what you write when right. you're the author, because, you know, it's like any, any art that you do, I imagine, I, I know a buddy of mine is a visual artist and he faces this all the time. Yeah. That he'll have like an abstract piece. And he said, people will come up to him and say, I get it. This is about Trump. Yes. He's leading us into the woods, yes. you know, and he'll think like, it has nothing to do with like, what I was thinking. Actually. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Like it means something different to everybody. Yes. And so I've heard people say that um, somewhere in the dark was very sad for them. I've heard people say it was really uplifting. I've yeah. heard him say they figured it out right away and that bummed him out. I've heard him say the total opposite. Really? How could so, you figure that I don't out know. totally yeah. out? Like, I don't know. I will say in, in the Go first ahead. draft, uh -huh. the killer was someone completely different. Okay. So, so, they, so yeah, you didn't totally know yeah. who it was going to be by the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Getting back to earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't totally I changed sure. it like in the second draft because it made more sense. Yeah. And it, I mean, honestly, it wasn't the most important part of the book, which I think was another reason I liked it a lot. Like it, who the killer was doesn't end up being what like resonates with you at the end of mm. it is how I felt about it. What's well, funny when you said people take different stuff away from it while I was writing out all of the questions. I know I've heard that before and I, I've heard like musicians talk about that, like songs can mean something totally different to sure. someone or, yeah. or like some authors will get questions and they'll be like, I mean, I wasn't intentionally doing that, but I guess that's a good point. So when I was writing out the questions, I was like, what are the questions going to say about me? <laughs> like the whole time I was like, what does it mean that I took this away from it? There's this great test in psychology mm -hmm. called the thematic apperception test. The yeah. TNT. Are you familiar with it? I feel like I remember. We took a lot of tests when we were in therapy. So it is, um, it's just like sketches. Okay. And it'll be like a picture. Yeah. And it'll be like, um, a pretty abstract scene people doing certain things right and what you're supposed to do is tell a story mm -hmm. as like what do you see? Awesome. see and what's fascinating is like when you get stuck with someone in therapy sometimes you pull it out and say what do you see here and what do you see here and like it'll be very revealing I because the same themes come up over and over again like right. disappointment sadness I, this person feels alone stuff yeah. like that like and it really it could you could make up whatever story you wanted about this situation yeah. portrayed in the in the picture. And that's typically probably why like the stuff they can't access yeah. about themselves is coming up. They create so a they narrative about something. it. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's yeah. pretty interesting. We were saying that all the way over. I was telling Tyler you had to practice too, and he was like, it's just gonna be analyzing all of your questions. <laughs> so I was <laughs> like, I've already thought about that yet. <laughs> reached a part in the episode where we are about to discuss spoilers for the book. So if the beginning of this episode has made you want to read the book and you haven't already, pause, go read it, come back, and enjoy listening to the spoilers. So um, you kind of said already 
that your idea was um, you wanted to write a character whose kind of liability ended up being their saving grace. Was that like the complete uh, like sounding board part for you? Or um, was there some like other idea that gave you the really specific idea of like, yeah. Someone who's been in confinement. Well, a story coming. So you were asking before about how being a psychologist kind of informs them. Yeah. And that is one thing that um, I guess is probably there. In yeah. that cases like that, in cases like Jesse's, actually are, it's really sad and terrible. Yes. They're actually like horrifically common. Every year, like the TBI or the FBI will find someone who's living under the circumstances or multiple people sometimes i, I mean it's horrific. it's too horrific really to a map yes um but it's not completely uncommon yeah and a convention of the genre is unreliable yes and like too often that i hurt my too often yeah it's like someone has an alcohol problem yes they're on some kind of medication yes. or Authors seem like they're like picking their brains to yes. try to find some way to make the reader have questions about, you know, is this, can you trust this narrator or not? And what I liked about this story was that Jesse is actually very reliable. It's everyone else who doesn't think that she's reliable. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to play with that a little bit because she does have this sort of imaginary world that she lived in, but her like recollection of events she's way sharper than everyone realizes uh she's just very quiet yes and so you know i, I like that she was an unusual person and uh, yeah yeah that was one of the that's leading into one of my other questions was about how a lot of the story was about her learning it, it felt like there was a lot about trust um, in, in regards to not trusting, not wanting to trust anyone and then not even trusting herself, but it felt like the transformation for her was when she actually started believing herself and believing yeah. that she was reliable even to herself. Yeah. That part was reminding me. It's not that she had been gaslit wouldn't be the right term, but it was reminding me of that being something that made her doubt herself so much because everyone else doubted her too. Yeah. She could be taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, and there's a point at which you get the sense that she feels like no more. So the other thing that was cool uh, was the relationship she had with her therapist. Oh, yeah. Was like, that was like, I was one of the people who definitely did not think the book was sad. And it was like very comforting to me, even just reading that relationship again. It was that, I know you can't talk about like, confidentiality like your patient specifically but was that the therapy okay rewind therapy scenes can feel played out whether it's like tv or books and it felt very like authentic and like true to even what my therapy was like when i was in therapy yeah so were you kind of informed in those scenes by like the relationships you've had with your clients yeah i'd say so one thing i'll tell you is that this is a kind of a weird segue in answering the question, uh -huh. but I'm kind of terrible about naming characters. So usually I just pick like the name of someone I know yeah. or a friend of mine or someone I knew way back when. And if I try to make up a name, it's too, it sounds really made up. So I just usually just borrow a bunch of people's names. That makes and sense. In this case, the therapist is someone who I know. Oh, that's cool. one of my favorite people, Amanda Parsons. Oh, that's She's cool. Like she would have been just like that. So it kind of helped me imagine, like, that particular sequence of events. Because I just kind of thought, ah, how, I mean, I know how Amanda would think. That is so. fascinating. Because she felt so fleshed out. So it makes sense that she was actually a real person. Real. Yeah. So the other thing that pops up a lot is Jesse mentioning going dim. So yeah. uh, the idea in... It, it reminded me of of dissociation and also like just hiding in general. It felt like kind of a blend of both of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of gets brought up in multiple situations. So like when she's in the closet, literally because she's trapped there, 
she's in the dark and then um later she likes being in the dark in general as a cocaine mechanism and then later she puts the case together in the dark there's like there's all the yeah uh, through lines of the darkness and was that part of what made you kind of call it going dim and did it also inform the title great questions okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> Like, that may be a level of sophistication that I don't have. Okay. <laughs> to be completely okay. candid. Um, I like the idea of her kind of blending in. Yeah. And I think that um, sometimes people who are uh, feel awkward or kind of unusual, yes. like, try to get into the background. Um, in the very beginning when I was writing this story, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know that um, I quite had that concept completely yeah. Yeah. like figured out um but i knew that i wanted her to be able to like background herself somehow um because like she has to do some stuff where she's not noticed in order for the story to work because it, it ends up being what ends up saving her right when miss parsons her therapist um offers her food specifically the pop tart she says kindness can break your heart I bite my lip because I want to cry so bad. And then later, at the very end, with Detective Marion, when um, they're at the dentist, she's kind of, like, realizing how nice it is to be supported and to have some people that she can trust. So where I'm headed with this was kind of, like, amidst the thrill of the story, there's so much, like, an arc of learning that some people can be trusted and that it's worth it and that it's really beneficial was that part of what you were kind of thinking, like, in writing someone who came from a trauma like that? Yeah, I mean, in a trauma like that, you, you would almost, like, have to reconstruct an entire world yes. to operate. And um, knowing even how to think of other people yeah. after spending that amount of time so disruptive. One thing that developmental psychologists have had to do in cases like that mm-hmm. is figure out what wasn't acquired during like a critical time and like for some kids it kind of depends on when they were in isolation you know it's almost like if you skip third grade you miss out on long division right something like that right and if you transfer schools at the wrong time you realize like oh i never learned how to do a b and c yeah it's kind of like that but they just took like 13 months like just sliced out and some of that is like was in her adolescence when it would have been like a time when you were developing Very important stuff yeah. yeah. Uh, I keep mentioning that I've been in therapy. And it reminded me so much that, it, especially near like kind of the end of my therapy, my therapist was talking to me about how my the trauma and the wounds to heal were about what did happen and it was also about what didn't happen. And so then if we were like focusing on like all the things that I didn't even realize I wasn't getting that yeah. similarly made me. A little bit distrustful, so yeah, I get that. Why I connected with the book so much, probably why I enjoyed everything, like coming full circle and like also working to her advantage too, because it's like that's uplifting to me to come from that stuff and still kind of win at the end. I I had hoped it would be, yeah. And in some ways, it's a coming of age story, right? Someone like um, told me, like as it was coming out, like you know, technically this could be YA. Because she's 19. That's true. I know. I was noticing that when I, I um, just read it again. Recently. Yeah, it, it, she's very young. Yeah. Um, in some ways, she's older than that age. In some ways, she's younger than that age. That's a really good point. Um, Let's see. I actually answered all this. I guess we've done well. I mean, we have done well. Some of your answers <laughs> actually answered some of my other questions. I'm just seeing have any other ones i mean the last one i had was how much and i've said it over and over again how much i loved that she was able to solve the murder because of like her highly attuned senses that were in captivity and it sounds like that was like your beginning point since you were wanting to write about someone whose liability ended up saving them did you know that you wanted it to be like that her senses overdeveloped or did that just kind of come to you as like a separate idea yeah, I, I've worked for a long time with a patient who's completely visually impaired, and it, it is really true that like that makes the sense. other senses become very highly sensitive. Um, and so I, I did think like that would be kind of a cool element to it. 
And, you know, um, I think especially with um, her attachment to those musicians, you know, a lot of people kind of find like attachment to a certain like musician or certain artist, certain songs. It's very emotional and like evocative about it. It's like a certain time in your life. If you hear a certain song, it really transports you. And people have an affection for musicians that they don't have for like other artists. They like they hear a certain song and it is the song that was playing when something happens and it really brings out their heart. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted I feel like that, or I certainly oh, yeah. felt like that when I was young. Very very yes. strong. So I wanted to like use that element of it too. Yeah. That still happens for me because like I was just hearing someone else talking about that on a podcast, how much like music is so tied to the time that it came out in your life too. yeah for sure or like the, I, this guy was talking about like there's a really happy song i can't remember what it was but it's like a really upbeat poppy song but it happened while he was going through his divorce and so like if he hears it he's like that just makes me sad and yeah. everyone's like but it's the best song ever and he's like but it came but it out during the worst sad. time of my life <laughs> yeah so that, yeah that makes a lot of sense um one question i didn't have on here if it was going to be a TV show or a movie, do you know who you would cast either as just Jesse or a couple yeah. of the, what, whatever, or um, how many characters you want? Well, I would definitely cast my friend as Amanda Barton. Yes, that would have to happen. Um, I pictured Detective Marion being Mark Ruffalo. That works. I, for some reason, I don't know if you know the show Bones, but he reminded me of David Boreanaz. But it's oh, probably right. because that guy's like an FBI agent. So yeah. I was just like mixing detectives together. But I did think that about him. Um, um, Jessie's a little bit trickier since she does have to be short. I was yeah. thinking about that earlier. But maybe it could be like uh, anyone. And then they do that stuff where they make people look shorter and taller based on yeah. their standing. Um. Finch would have to be someone who kind of looked perfect. Yeah. You know, like there was an actress. Yeah. yeah. The actress who was in, um, she's been in other things, but she was in um, Super 8. Okay. Yeah. She's like the cool, like slightly older adolescent. Okay. Like she looks pretty put together. Yeah. It'd have to be somebody who looked pretty polished. Yeah. That would make sense. Hopefully it does get turned into a TV show. Would Man. you? Would you? I'm assuming you would want that. Yeah, I know. Right. So I know some some random people are like no. No, it would be that great. That would be cool. What would you prefer, TV show or movie? Do you have a preference based off I'm the a movie? Guy. A movie. Yeah. Yeah, I can't tell. Some books you really can't like it. It's like uh, the eight episode thing really works for it. But when I was rereading it this week, I was realizing how much happens in one day. I'd kind of forgotten that. So yeah. I reread it. So it would probably be better as a as a movie. Do you have anything else you want to talk about from the book? Gosh, mm, no. I, 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 you know, it's funny. Like, I, I feel we were talking before about yeah. like the time frame of when things get going. Yes. And I feel like I have to almost kind of jog my memory to talk about this book. Yes. Because I wrote it like pre pandemic. That's what I was going to ask. How yeah. long ago? It was probably a while ago then. It came out probably in the worst time in history to release a novel. Did it really? Yeah. I, I feel like I got it around the time that it came out. Did it? Was it in January? It was in August of 20. Oh, so no, I didn't. Okay. So it was like um, the pandemic had shut everything down. Yep. The, the presidential election was like ramping up. Yeah. And like it just felt like. Yeah. Chaos. It was tough. It was very chaotic at that point. It was tough. Yeah. Well, where can people find you? What? Yeah. So Instagram is the best, like, probably the place where I'm most, like, present. Yeah. Um, It's rjjacob75. And then um, I'm working with a different publisher now. I'm working with Sourcebooks Landmark. And pretty soon we're going to start to see, like, cover stuff from my new book nice. and it's called always the first to die that's exciting so that'll be next year yeah it'll be september so maybe you'll have to come back and talk about that one. yeah i will cool yeah well, thank you thank you